This is the review for Unit 7 Cell Division. Before we start talking about the two different types of cell division, let's talk about what type of cells are present in living organisms. Cells can be either diploid or haploid. A diploid cell is a cell that has two sets of chromosomes. One set of the chromosomes came from one parent and the other set of chromosomes came from the other parent. And what type of cells in your body are diploid? Well, it's your somatic cells, so pretty much every cell in your body. Um, these are cells that make up your body. So somatic cells, you could think of as body cells. These include things like your skin cells, your muscle cells, cells that make up your organs, or pretty much any other tissue in your body. These are somatic cells. So if you looked at every somatic cell in a female, for example, this is what you would see in the number of chromosomes or pieces of DNA that would be present in each of those cells. There would be 46 total chromosomes in her diploid cells. And there's two sets here, as you can see. There's 23 chromosomes in one set and 23 chromosomes in the other set. And that's why we have 23 pairs here. These pairs of chromosomes are called homologous chromosomes. So in diploid cells, we have homologous chromosomes, and these are chromosomes that are similar to each other. And in each chromosome and each homologous pair, for example, this first homologous pair here, each chromosome in that pair came from a different parent. One came from the mother and one came from the father. If we look at the second pair of homologous chromosomes, one chromosome came from the mother, one came from the father. Each homologous pair is similar, each chromosome in the homologous pair is similar in that it's the same length and it has similar genetic information on there, so it has similar genes. However, haploid cells only have one set of chromosomes in them, so a lot of times we'll use the letter just N to designate haploid and we'll use 2N to designate diploid. Therefore, a haploid cell will only have half the number of chromosomes as a diploid cell. So it's as simple as that. A diploid cell has two sets of chromosomes. Haploid cells have half of that, so they have one set of chromosomes. So the only cells in humans, so the only cell inside, cells inside your body that are haploid are your gametes. Gametes are used for sexual reproduction. Another word for gametes or other words for, to describe the same thing include sex cells, sperm, and egg. So all of these words are describing the same type of cell, but these cells are haploid. Where would you find your gametes? Well, you would find them in your reproductive organs, either your testes or your ovaries. So if we were to look inside the ovaries of a female, you would find inside there the eggs, and instead of these eggs being diploid having two sets of chromosomes each one each egg would only have one set of chromosomes so the second chromosome um, in each of these pairs has disappeared somehow okay so this makes sense right whenever you have offspring you're only giving your offspring half of your genetic information and your spouse is giving them the other half of the genetic information. So this is why gametes have to be haploid. They have to have half the number of chromosomes of than any of the other cells in your body because you're only going to be giving your offspring half of your genetic information. So let's now talk about the two different types of cell division and their purpose. So mitosis is one type of cell division. This produces new cells that are genetically identical to the original cell. So that means the DNA sequences are exactly the same. That means the number of chromosomes is exactly the same um, in the new cells as the original cell. When would you want to replicate cells and create clones of cells? Well, this would need to happen during growth. This needs to happen whenever you're repairing tissues, if tissue has gotten damaged. Uh, this happens all the time because you're constantly replacing cells in your body. Your skin cells are constantly replacing themselves. Your intestinal cells, the cells lining your intestines are constantly replacing themselves. All of this is mitosis. Also, mitosis is used for asexual reproduction in single-celled organisms like an amoeba or stuff like that. So they're going to need to reproduce 
uh, using mitosis. Meiosis, on the other hand, is a process that halves the number of chromosomes. So it's reducing the number, the amount of genetic information in cells. And in addition, it also creates genetic uh, variation. The only time meiosis happens in your body is whenever you're creating gametes. So it's whenever your body is producing sperm or egg cells. Because as I said before, your sperm and your eggs only have half your genetic information. So meiosis is used to create those cells. So to summarize this, for mitosis, if you're starting with, for both of these, we're starting with cells that are diploid, mitosis and meiosis. So these cells have two sets of chromosomes. If we're talking about mitosis, what are the new cells going to look like? Well, they're going to be identical to the original one, so they're going to have the exact same number of chromosomes. They'll be diploid. However, through meiosis, we're having the number of chromosomes, so meiosis always goes diploid to haploid, having the number of chromosomes. Before we talk about mitosis and meiosis, let's talk about what has to happen before a cell can actually divide or before it can enter mitosis and meiosis. Before a cell divides, it has to replicate the DNA, the genetic information. And what's really important here is I want you to pay attention to the different terms that we use to describe these different uh, stages of DNA replication in a way. So here I have a single chromosome, a single DNA molecule here. However, when the DNA replicates, each strand of DNA copies itself, and now we have two identical strands of DNA attached at this location called the centromere. Now, before DNA replication, we had one chromosome. After the DNA replicates, we still only have one chromosome, but we call it a duplicated chromosome. So here, we have one duplicated chromosome, and now it is made up of two chromatids. And so we call each strand of a duplicated chromosome a chromatid, or in other words, we sometimes refer to this as sister chromatids. And it's during mitosis that these sister chromatids separate, and when they separate, that's like when I like to think of them having their own identity and each one of these strands becomes its own chromosome, its own individual chromosome. So after they separate, whenever they're separate like this, we no longer call them chromatids. We call them only chromosomes. Chromatids only exist whenever the chromosome is duplicated and looks like an X here. All right, so before mitosis happens, the DNA is going to replicate. And then during mitosis or this, this nuclear division, the, uh, the sister chromatids will actually separate and move into two different cells. So let's talk about what happens in the phases of mitosis in order for this to happen. Well, first we start with prophase, remember? Pro meaning first. And what it, the important things that happen here is that the DNA condenses um, into the chromosome. So DNA usually is very, uh, I guess you could think of it as looking like spaghetti and they're all loose. And before the, what, when, before the, the genetic information can be split up, that DNA has to condense into these chromosomes. Also, these spindle fibers form and they attach the chromosomes. So spindle fibers are proteins that actually attach to each one of the chromosomes. And then the nuclear membrane is going to dissolve all in prophase, all in this first stage of mitosis. Nuclear membrane needs to dissolve because the DNA has to be free in the cell so that it can move around. Then this is followed by metaphase. During metaphase, I always think of M for middle. This is when all the chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell. And then during that's followed by anaphase. Anaphase, I always think of A for way, and this is or apart. And this is when the sister chromatids get pulled apart from each other. And an equal amount of chromosomes move to each side of the cell. And then during telophase, I always think of TE as the end. And this is when it's like pretty much the opposite of prophase. The chromosomes decondense, the spindle fibers attach, and the nuclear membranes now reform around each set of chromosomes. So notice what happens during telophase is that we have a single cell with 
two uh, nuclei inside of there. So the next objective, objective two says distinguish between mitosis and cytokinesis. Now, an important thing to note here is that cytokinesis is not part of mitosis. Mitosis only consists of four stages. So if we ever ask you to write down the phase of mitosis or the phase of meiosis, you should never be writing down cytokinesis and you should never be writing down interphase if many of you know what that means. Um, interphase is not part of mitosis or meiosis and neither is cytokinesis. Cytokinesis needs to occur after the genetic information has separated. Um, and this is the division of the cytoplasm or all the fluid inside of a cell. And this is also when all the organelles like the mitochondria, the chloroplast, the Golgi bodies also split evenly into two different cells. So cytokinesis happens after mitosis. It's a little bit different in animal and plant cells. Animal cells don't have a cell wall, so all they have to do is pinch off that plasma membrane, and that is called a cleavage furrow. In plant cells, however, since they have a cell wall, instead of being able to pinch off, they actually have to create what is called a cell plate. And this cell plate are vesicles that form in between the two new nuclei, and these vesicles secrete new, the new cell wall that it will eventually form to create the two new cells. The next objective, objective four, says, I skipped objective three because I actually just talked about it. It says compare cytokinesis in plant and animal cells, and we just talked about that. Uh, number four says recognize homologous chromosomes in a karyotype. So a karyotype, this term just means a picture of chromosomes in a cell. So, um, and also remember homologous chromosomes are chromosomes that are similar to each other. You got one from each parent. So here I have, a pair of homologous chromosomes. And in this case, each chromosome is duplicated. So if we were to have a bunch of chromosomes that we got out of a cell, we could actually pair them up with their homologous pair, which looks similar to each other. The banding pattern is the same. These banding patterns are showing like where certain genes are located. Also, the centromere location is the same on each homologous chromosome. Notice that. So let's count how many chromosomes are present here. So what are the number of homologous pairs present? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 homologous pairs. How many chromosomes are present here? One, well, we know that each homologous pair has one, two chromosomes, so we would have 22 chromosomes. How many chromatids? Well, we know that each chromosome has two chromatids, so we just do two times 22, and we have 44 chromatids in this picture. All right, so number five says, describe the characteristic events which occur during each phase of meiosis. So remember, the whole goal of meiosis is to create haploid cells. So we're always gonna go from diploid to haploid. However, for this whole process to happen, it requires two rounds of division. So we have to go through what meiosis one, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase one, and then we have to go through another round. Each one of those two daughter cells has to go through another round of division, meiosis two. An important thing to remember on an exam is that if you're talking about the phases of meiosis, you must indicate whether you're talking about meiosis one or meiosis two because different things happen in both of these, um, these different stages of meiosis. So make sure you put that one or two down or you're gonna lose points. So let's talk about what happens in each stage of meiosis. So one thing I want you to see here is that during meiosis one, we'll already go from diploid to haploid. All right, so how many chromosomes are present here? This is before meiosis has happened. One, two, three, four chromosomes. Well, before meiosis happens, these chromosomes are going to duplicate themselves. So now they're duplicated. Here's our homologous pairs there. There's one homologous pair. Here's another homologous pair. So we have a total of four chromosomes still in this cell. During early prophase one, the same thing that happened during mitosis is gonna happen at the beginning. We're gonna have the nuclear membrane dissolving. We're gonna have these spindle fibers forming and attaching to each one of the chromosomes. 
However, it's in late prophase one that we see a huge difference here. What happens here is that the homologous chromosomes actually pair up with each other. And this is our major difference between meiosis and mitosis. And this all happens in prophase. We have this process where the homologous chromosomes pair up, and this is called synapsis. Know this word. Synapsis is when homologous chromosomes or similar chromosomes find each other. This does not happen in mitosis. So here, the homologous chromosomes pair up. So this changes everything. One thing that you don't need to know for this exam is that this is when we get genetic variation created. Uh, these homologous chromosomes will actually exchange pieces of DNA, but you don't need to know about that. Okay? Then these homologous chromosomes are going to stay together for a little bit. So when they line up in the middle of the cell during metaphase one, they're still paired up. So you can tell when cells are in prophase one or metaphase one because the homologous chromosomes are next to each other. But then in anaphase one, it's actually these homologous chromosomes that separate. The sister chromatids stay together and they move to opposite sides. How many chromosomes are moving to each side? Well, two are. One, two, one, two. So we're already starting to create two haploid nuclei. We're separating the two sets of chromosomes during anaphase one. Then during telophase one, what's happening here is that the nucleus is forming around each one of these haploid sets. So now we have two chromosomes in each one, and this will be followed by cytokinesis one, which is division again of the cytoplasm and organelles. And then at the end of meiosis one, we have two haploid cells. Our chromosome reduction is complete. But the problem here is that each chromosome still is duplicated. And if we just ended there, there's still too much genetic information in each one of these cells. So the whole point of meiosis II is to separate those sister chromatids. So it's going to look just like mitosis, except the cells are haploid. So during prophase II, all the similar things happen. The nuclear membrane disappears. DNA would condense all of that stuff, spindle fibers are gonna form. Then in metaphase two, they're gonna line up in the middle of the cell. And then in anaphase two, now we pull apart the sister chromatids. And then in telophase two, we form our new nuclei. Those spindle fibers dissolve up. And then cytokinesis two is the division of that cytoplasm and organelles. And at the end of meiosis two and the end of cytokinesis, now we have four haploid cells. Each one only has one copy of a chromosome type and we are done with meiosis. And notice also that each one is genetically different from each other. None of these look alike. And also none of them look like the original cell. So this is how we create genetic vari variation. This is why all your offspring would look different and why no two individuals will look alike. Remember, another important thing that I want you to remember is that meiosis equals the formation of gametes. And different gametes are produced in males and females. In males, what happens is called spermatogenesis. So we start with a diploid cell that goes through meiosis one to create two haploid cells. And then each one of those cells create four daughter cells. And then those cells mature into sperm. So each time during spermatogenesis, four functional sperm cells are created. However, what's interesting is that in females, in females, we start out with our diploid cell. And then after the first round of division, notice that it's not completely even. One daughter cell gets a lot more cytoplasm than the other daughter cell. And then during the next round of division, again, we see this uneven division of the cytoplasm and only one of the daughter cells, one of these four, one, two, three, four, only one of them becomes an egg, a functional egg. The other three daughter cells actually are really, really, really tiny, and we call them polar bodies. 
and they actually just die off. This is why each month when females ovulate, they'll only release one egg, not four eggs. Uh, so this is a major difference between the production of sperm and the production of eggs. So in females, they still produce four daughter cells, but only one of them becomes a functional egg. Objective six is, says compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis. So this is a really good diagram kind of to do this. Notice that both of these cells are starting out diploid. Both has four chromosomes in here. These chromosomes are just intertwined with each other because they're pairing up. Um, in mitosis, during prophase, there's no synapsis. But in meiosis, there's synapsis. Okay, that's the big difference between mitosis and meiosis. During metaphase of mitosis, the chromosomes align the middle individually, so all four of them line up like that, whereas in metaphase one, it's the homologous pairs that are lining up together. In anaphase of mitosis, the sister chromatids get pulled apart, so four chromosomes are going to each side, whereas in anaphase one of meiosis, notice what's happening is the homologous chromosomes are um, each chromosome in the homologous pair is separating. So the homologous pairs separate and move to each side. This is where we're creating our haploidiness. I made up that word. Now uh, we have telophase of mitosis. Now we have two daughter nuclei. Each is diploid. Each has two sets of chromosomes in there, two long ones and two short ones. And Notice there's four chromosomes in each nucleus, whereas in telophase one, the daughter nuclei are already haploid. There's two in each one. And then if we look at the end results, in mitosis, we have two identical daughter cells, identical to each other and identical to the original one uh, before the DNA replicated. And then in meiosis two, that is when the sister chromatids separate and that is when we get four genetically different daughter cells that result. So to summarize, which of these processes is preceded by replication of chromosomes? Both of them. What are the number of rounds of cell division? Well, it only has one round of cell division in mitosis, but two in meiosis. And what kind of cells does it occur? Does these process occur in? Mitosis occurs in all your somatic cells. All your body cells are going to do this. Whereas in meiosis, it's only going to occur in cells that will become gametes. So these are special cells in the ovaries or the testes. What are the number of daughter cells produced in mitosis? We have two. In meiosis, it's always four because we have those two rounds of division. Is the original cell haploid or diploid? In mitosis, it's diploid. In meiosis, it's also diploid. What about the daughter cells? Well, mitosis is better be diploid because they're going to be identical to the original. Meiosis, they'll be haploid. Does synapsis occur? Well, not in mitosis, but it does in meiosis. And what about the genetic content of the daughter cells in relation to the original cell? Well, they're going to be the same in mitosis, and they're going to be, this in the relationship to each other, they'll also be the same. In meiosis, they'll be genetically different from the original cell and genetically different from one another. That's summarizing the major differences between mitosis and meiosis. And... I believe that is the end of this unit. So if you feel comfortable with that, you can stop there or I'll go through some practice problems to test your knowledge here, give you some tips along the way as well. So a cell with 10 chromosomes undergoes mitosis and cytokinesis. How many daughter cells are produced and how many chromosomes does each have? Well, we know that mitosis creates cells that are identical to the original, so it better have 10 chromosomes. And we know that mitosis creates two daughter cells. So our answer here is A. The following figure represents a process of cell division in an unknown organism. Which phase of cell division is represented by the cells in column B? Well, if we look at the cells in column A, we can see that we have two pairs of homologous chromosomes here. Here's one pair, here's the other pair. Don't worry about the coloring. Just note that they look the same. These two look the same and these two look the same. So here we can already tell that this is meiosis happening because with homologous chromosomes are paired up. What happens here is that you can see the homologous chromosomes got separated into two different cells. 
So what phase of cell division is represented by the cells in column B? Well, since they're lined up right in the middle of the cell and each cell is haploid, this has to be what? Metaphase two, right? Because metaphase two, we know the cells are already haploid and that's whenever uh, the chromosomes would be lined up in the middle. Which of the following cells is in metaphase? So we know metaphase means middle, M for middle. So here's the only one with the chromosomes lined up in the middle. So this is C. This is anaphase, this is prophase, and this would be telophase here at the end. The woolly monkey has 62 chromosomes. So 2N equals 62, so 62 chromosomes in the diploid uh, cell. How many chromosomes would you find in a woolly monkey zygote? Well, what is a zygote? Remember, a zygote is the first cell of an organism. So you started out as a zygote, one cell that was diploid. Okay, zygotes are always diploid. It's the result of the sperm and egg coming together. When they fuse together, they combine their genetic information to create a diploid cell, and that is the zygote. So we know zygotes are always diploid. So the zygote would also have 62 chromosomes because that is the, the number of chromosomes in a diploid cell. How many chromatids are present in the following picture? How many do you think? There are four. One, two, three, four. How many chromosomes are present here? Chromosomes would be two. Considering the following original cell, 2n equals four, so the original cell has four chromosomes, which of the cells A, B, or C would immediately follow their original cell in meiosis? So here we can see that the chromosomes are paired up, but they're not lined up in the middle, so this must be prophase. So, or prophase one, we gotta be specific there. So what would follow that? That would be metaphase one. So which of these would be metaphase one? Well, we know that these chromosomes have to stay together in their pairs. So the only answer here that would work would be A. They are stayed in their pairs and they're lined up in the middle. What is the name of the partition that forms during cytokinesis in animal cells? What is it? If you remember, cleavage furrow. Uh, another question, which of the following processes does not occur during mitosis? Chromosomes become visible, well that we know that happens in prophase. Two separate nuclei are formed, well that happens in telophase. Similar chromosomes pair with one another. Hmm, what does that, what's another term for that? Well that's synapsis, right? And synapsis doesn't occur in mitosis, so we know the answer has to be C. But let's just check D. Chromatids are separated by spindle fibers. Yeah, that's what happens in anaphase and mitosis. So just remember synapsis does not happen in mitosis. Let's do, this one's a challenging one. The blue whale has 22 pairs of chromosomes. So that's 44 total chromosomes. Following mitosis, the daughter cells would each have a total of, well, we know the original one has 22 pairs of so 44 chromosomes. Mitosis always creates identical cells. So it would have 44. So our first number should be 44. After meiosis one, the two daughter cells would have well, remember, meiosis one, we always go. We already have gone haploid after meiosis one. So each one would have 22 chromosomes. And after meiosis two, the gametes would all have also 22 chromosomes. So our answer here would be B, 44, 22, 22. Just remember that haploidy already happens at the end of meiosis one. We just have to go through meiosis two again to separate those sister chromatids. And that's the end. Hopefully uh, you feel a little better about mitosis and meiosis.